The unsettling of a nation is an easy work. The settling is not. Thirty years after the plantation, life in Ulster was still hard. The Irish professed loyalty to King Charles I of England, but many still wanted to recover lands lost to the newcomers. They thought themselves humiliated by those who scorned the Catholic religion and the old Gaelic way of life. These feelings of discontent were to fuel a desire for revenge, and in the autumn of 1641, events came to a head with the outbreak of a great rebellion. It had been no hard matter to have been a prophet, to have foreseen those black clouds engendering in the Irish air, which broke out afterwards into such fearful tempests of blood. On the evening of the 22nd of October, Sir Phil O'Neill, who was a very prominent figure in County Tyrone society, he was a justice of the peace, he was an Irishman, but he had integrated very well into the, the new order. He went to visit his friend uh, at Charlemont, uh, Lord Caulfield. Uh, it wasn't unusual because he often had dinner with Lord Caulfield, but on this occasion uh, Sir Philip arrived with a troop of uh, very badly disciplined and very ill-organised soldiers. The idea, of course, was to take Charlemont, and this was to be the first step in a rising which was eventually to engulf all of Ulster. Sir Philip O'Neill assumed authority in Ulster, and on the 24th of October issued a proclamation at Dungannon. Every person should make speedy repair unto their own houses under pain of death, and that no further hurt be done to anyone under the like pain. While the proclamation promised no injury to the king's subjects, all over the north the situation was already getting out of control. In South Derry, money more was taken by the rebels, and the towns of Macarafelt and Balaki plundered and burnt to the ground. All through that period from 1609 to 1641, if you look through the letters and the official dispatches and so on, you get the continuing uh, note of fear among the planters, or at any rate of defensiveness. They were, they were obliged to carry out uh, certain obligations like building fortified farmhouses and so on, which was all part of the defense plan, the defense network. These mischiefs and miseries cause us to stand continually upon our guard. And when we travel, we take good strength with us. Wherefore, might it please you, when you send those materials I wrote for in my last letter, also to send over some more arms, as muskets, calivers, powder, and bullets. The last calivers bullets you sent were all too big. Wherefore, if you please to send two pairs of bullet moulds, and lead were best, so they may be made fit for the pieces. Also, some halberds and half pikes. The settlers were rightly fearful for their lives and property. At Belturbet, County Cavan, a group of local colonists were seized by the rebels and led out to a nearby bridge. Most were thrown over the parapet to drown in the waters of the River Erne. Others were clubbed to death. It's said that one gentleman was so distracted that he laughed hysterically while being run through with a pike. Rumours were flying all around the place. Many people simply decided to get even with those uh, who they had had trouble with before. Uh, people that they owed money to, debts were simply liquidated by murdering them. Uh, people who uh, decided to settle old scores. Uh, in many cases, protection rackets were set up, and people went from one person to the other, uh, threatening to protect them. And if they didn't, uh, the worst would happen to them. And in fact, in a number of occasions, we know that people were murdered by gangs uh, because they simply didn't pay their protection money. The Irish servant, which overnight was undressing his master in duty, the next morning was stripping master and mistress with a too officious tyranny. What happened was that the rebel would, would come to a district 
uh, they would strip the Protestant of their clothes as well as their possessions. Uh, they would tell them that if they didn't leave the area within seven days, uh, then they would be massacred. Uh, so the Protestant community left the areas concerned. They left, in fact, in many cases, naked. Uh, it was a very severe winter. There was snow on the ground at this time, and many of them did die of, of hardship, of cold, uh, perhaps to some extent of shock. The Protestant settlers were systematically stripped, clearly with a symbolic intention. In other words, they'd come with nothing. They were to leave with nothing. knows for certain how many people died in the course of these atrocities. It was probably about 2,000, although the number of victims soon became inflated to fantastic levels, far beyond the total Protestant population of the time. What is known is that what happened in that bloody autumn of 1641 was to influence events and attitudes in Ireland for generations to come. Philip Taylor, late of Portadown in the county of Armagh, husbandman sworn, says that about the 24th of October last, he, this deponent, was taken prisoner at Portadown by Toole McCann, a notorious rebel. At which time the rebels first took the castle, then they assaulted and pillaged the town and burnt all the houses on the further side of the water. And then the said rebels drowned a great number of English Protestants of men, women, and children in this deponent's sight, some with their hands tied behind their backs, and says that the number of them that were then so drowned amounted to 196 persons. This was a massacre which left a very, very dramatic effect uh, on the Protestant mind at the time. Uh, for example, it's the only uh, massacre uh, after which ghosts appear because some deponents claim that Shortly after the massacre, for about a week, a spectral white figure appeared walking across the river, crying, revenge, revenge. And of course, this is one of the functions that ghosts had in 17th century belief, as in Hamlet's father, to cry, revenge, revenge, for wrongdoings that were done to them. And of course, right down to the present day, it's the only event from the 1640s which has actually made it onto an orange banner. So it's clearly made a very important impact on the Protestant mind. I sometimes think a lot of our psychology really derives from that period, though we don't talk about it very much, and it doesn't figure very largely in history, but throughout the whole Protestant population, not just the Presbyterians, uh, I think there developed in Ireland a sense uh, of always having to look over their shoulder, which of course didn't improve uh, matters, relations between the, the, the two religious groups in the population. Almost inevitably, the rumours of massacre and atrocity were to lead to acts of vengeance on Catholics. In January 1642, members of the McGee family were murdered in Island McGee, County Antrim. In the popular imagination, many more Catholics were killed, driven over the Gobbins Cliffs to their deaths. You can interpret this in very widely uh, different ways according to your modern psychology, according to your modern view of what the Irish problem really is. But uh, there's no question about it that it, it gives rise to a sense of siege, a sense of beleaguerment. And um, the siege, if there is such a thing as a siege mentality, and if it's a factor in this situation, and it would be hard to deny it, uh, then it really begins in the middle of the 17th century, by my reckoning. In the summer of 1642, civil war broke out in England between King Charles I and his Parliament. No one living in Ireland could be sure if either King or Parliament would look after their own long-term interests. They also had to contend with several different armies of English, Irish and Scots who were operating throughout the country. In this confusion of shifting allegiances, Irish Catholics found themselves pulled in different directions. 
James Butler, Earl of Ormond, represented the King's interest and sought peace on terms acceptable to the Old English. Cardinal Rinocini, the Papal Nuncio, hoped for outright victory and the return of the lands and liberties of Irish Catholics. Owen Roe O'Neill, with 30 years experience in the Spanish service, held the best hopes of an Irish military victory. In 1642, leading Catholics from all four provinces of Ireland met in Kilkenny to set up a provisional government. It was called the Confederation of Kilkenny. The Confederation gathered the different factions together under the common banner of Catholicism. It drew up the first written constitution of Ireland. It also supported the Royalist cause and adopted the motto, For God, for the King, for the land of Ireland united. It was a call for unity that was to prove elusive as a confused war dragged on for several years. Owen Roe O'Neill was to win the only Irish victory of note when he defeated Monroe's Scottish troops at Ben Burb, County Tyrone. Owen Roe was the nephew of the great O'Neill. But like his uncle, Owen Roe was unable to press home his advantage. Only one man was to prove strong enough to impose his will totally upon Ireland. That man was an Englishman, Oliver Cromwell. He had three major characteristics. The first of those was that he was a superb general. There's no doubt at all about that. The second one was that he was a religious zealot. Uh, and again, there is absolutely no doubt about that. And the third one, which I think is very often forgotten about him, is that he was an English nationalist. And there are very, very few people in, in British history who have combined all three of those. A captain of men, a very, very convinced religious zealot of any description, and an English nationalist of maybe a type that wasn't seen before and possibly has never been seen since. His first attitude towards the Irish was a strategic one, that the Irish were Catholic and that they were allied with Spain and France. And of course, through, throughout the 1640s, both Spain and France had supported Ireland uh, during the war. So their Catholicism, allied with their continental powers, uh, was for Cromwell a very considerable problem strategically. Cromwell arrived in Ireland in August 1649 and straight away marched north to Drogheda. He was filled with a religious fervour and was determined to avenge what he saw as the wholesale slaughter of Irish Protestants at the hands of Catholics in 1641. You broke the Union. You, unprovoked, put the English to the most unheard of and most barbarous massacre without respect of sex or age that ever the sun beheld, and at a time when Ireland was in perfect peace. Cromwell himself, in his own religious beliefs, uh, subscribed, of course, to the idea which was very common in the 17th century uh, that they were living in the last days. And there were all sorts of radical sects grew up around this. And Cromwell himself believed the, in the Antichrist. And he believed that the Antichrist was on that, the earth at that time. He identified the Antichrist with the Pope, as many others did at that time. So for him, the war in Ireland was almost a religious war. Uh, a war, the battle between Protestant England, representing the truth, and the anti-Christian forces. Uh, of, of Catholicism. Uh, and he saw this not just in Irish terms, but in European terms as well, uh, because he saw the uh, wars that were going on in Europe as part of the wars of the Antichrist, uh, as predicted in Revelation. At five o'clock in the evening of Tuesday the 10th of September, soldiers of the new model army stormed the town walls. They were ordered to show no mercy to any who offered armed resistance. Cromwell hoped that opposition elsewhere in Ireland would collapse in the face of a decisive victory. After heavy fighting, the parliamentarians forced a breach in the wall and were soon firmly established in the grounds of St. Mary's Church. The fighting moved to the mill mount where that night, 2,000 men were put to the sword. The survivors were now in full retreat across the River Boyne to the other part of the town. When 100 men refused to surrender, Cromwell ordered the steeple of St. Peter's Church to be burned. 
one man was heard to cry in the midst of the flames, God damn me, God confound me, I burn, I burn. There was no doubt in the mind of Oliver Cromwell as to the righteousness of his actions. This was a righteous judgment of God upon these barbarous wretches who have imbued their hands in so much innocent blood and that it will tend to prevent effusion of blood for the future, which are the satisfactory grounds for such actions, which otherwise cannot but work remorse and regret. In Rotter, I suppose you'd have to say, he observed the rules of war as they were understood in the 17th century. Uh, in other words, he, he called upon the garrison to, to, to surrender. The garrison refused to surrender. He sacked the cow town. Uh, he, in effect, slaughtered the garrison. Uh, then he went rather beyond, uh, I suppose, the rules of war, because some of the slaughter was of, of civilians. Uh, but I think you have to say that by 17th century standard, particularly European standard, uh, what he did was, was pretty commonplace. That if you didn't, in fact, obey a call to surrender, if you tried to hold out, uh, then you took the consequences. There are so many atrocities in Irish history committed by all sides, uh, by the English, by the Irish, by various elements of the Irish population against one another, uh, that it seems a bit odd, in a way, to pick out an incident like the Siege of Drogheda and say, well, this is something really beyond uh, normal limits of warfare in the 17th century. It wasn't, of course. In the 17th century, we had the religious wars in Germany and Central Europe, the Thirty Years' War, where the most appalling atrocities were taking place. At the same time, it seems to be connected in some way. But... Cromwell's utter heartlessness uh, in that instant, in that, at that particular state, and the fact that that's documented and recorded has left an indelible mark on the Irish psyche. Cromwell turned south and sacked Wexford. Other towns in Munster were forced to submit voluntarily and the Catholic Confederation disintegrated. A policy of banishment was initiated to finally crush any further resistance. It was decreed that all transportable persons move west of the River Shannon. The Irish rebels had to face the stark choice of moving to Hell or Connaught. When the campaign had finished, Cromwell rewarded his soldiers as soldiers had been rewarded before by granting them land in Ireland, by taking it from the Irish, by telling the Irish that they could go to Hell or to Connaught, and the land that they left was given to the Cromwellian soldiers. Uh, it was in settlement of pay. It was also in settlement of, if you like, it was a form of redundancy money because warfare was now over. Parliament controlled the country and there was no need for an army as large as had been maintained by Parliament. So soldiers simply had to be got rid of. And this was one way of keeping them quiet, by giving them land in Ireland. Cromwell's infamous campaign in Ireland certainly created the same kind of reaction among Catholics in Ireland as 1641 had created among Protestants in the North. Of course, in picking these things out, the way Protestants pick out things from Irish history, the way Catholics pick out things from Irish history, we are being desperately selective. We're not, in fact, talking about history at all. There are two histories of Ireland. There is the history which is written in the books, and there's the history which influences the way we behave towards each other. 